It is my pleasure tonight to introduce Robert Wright. Robert Wright is the author of The Evolution of God, a New York Times bestseller and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His other books include The Moral Animal, which the New York Times Book Review named one of the 10 best books of 1994, and Non Zero, which Bill Clinton called astonishing and instructed White House staff members to read. In 2009, Wright was named by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 global thinkers. He is visiting professor of science and religion at Union Theological Seminary in New York. It is editor-in-chief of the websites bloggingheads.tv and meaningoflife.tv. You can take his free online course, Buddhism and Modern Psychology, starting September 4th on Coursera.org through Princeton University. In Why Buddhism is True, Robert Wright draws on new findings in evolutionary psychology and neuroscience to trace suffering to fear, anxiety, and anger, the strong emotions that alerted our ancestors to danger and helped them survive. Meditation can provide us with the clarity to see the inherent meaninglessness of these drives and dispel their power over us. Publishers Weekly says, Wright fascinates readers with this journey through evolutionary psychology in search of answers to the question of whether Buddhism's diagnosis of the human condition is true. Wright's joyful and insightful book is both entertaining and informative, equally accessible to general audiences and more experienced practitioners. Please join me in welcoming Robert Wright to Politics and Prose. Well, thank you, Kate. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and thanks uh, to Politics and Prose for hosting me. I used to live in Washington. In fact, I lived about a mile from here. Uh, and I know what an important community resource politics and prose was then, and I'm sure it still is now. Um, uh, yeah, round of applause, sure. Use the mic. Um, I have to say, when I lived in D.C. in the uh, late 80s and 90s, uh, if you had asked me to estimate how many Washingtonians I thought you could get to turn out for a talk on Buddhist meditation, I would have guessed <laughs> fewer than this. Um, in fact, would you mind if I took a picture of this? <laughs> no, seriously. Because uh, every once in a while, my wife doubts my importance. <laughs> yeah, isn't it funny? Maybe, maybe we're married to the same woman. But, but um, so uh, now there are two explanations I can think of for why you would get a, a bigger crowd for this than I might have thought. One is that meditation has actually gotten more. Uh, popular uh, since the 90s, including mindfulness meditation, which I, I talk about in the book. Um, and the other explanation is that maybe there's been a uh, development in American politics that has left people uh, <laughs> more desperately seeking the peace of mind that meditation is said <laughs> to bring. Um, and I actually, I actually do think uh, mindfulness meditation has an important kind of relevance to uh, this moment in American politics, this moment of intense polarization, um, and a moment when we have a president who is more controversial than the average president. Um, but I, I don't think it's just that it can kind of provide a cocoon of, of kind of peace uh, amid the storm. I think there's a, a subtler contribution that it can make, and, and, and I hope to have time to talk about that uh, a little at the end. Um, the uh, First, I want to quickly uh, give you an overview of the book. Um, it'll be quick. If it's too quick, uh, just ask me to elaborate during the question and answer session, which I want to make sure and leave time for. Uh, this is the first time I've given a talk about the book, so if the talk is uh, lacking in coherence, I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> um, I think the first thing I have to do is talk about the title. Um, I, uh, in the past, I've written books with ambitious titles. Uh, arguably grandiose titles, arguably grandiose to the point of being obnoxious, <laughs> but I have to say I think this is a personal best. Uh, <laughs> why Buddhism is true. I've really, I've really outdone myself. Um, so I want to talk about the title in a way that I hope will leave you not considering it obnoxious. The um, first, it's not about what you might call the supernatural part of Buddhism, reincarnation and so on. Uh, I focus on the naturalistic part, that is to say, uh, uh, claims in Buddhist philosophy and psychology that you could appraise from the, the point of view of modern philosophy and modern psychology. That's what I do in the book. Um, now, second, you might ask, like, what, 
what is it that I'm saying is true about Buddhism? Uh, what part of Buddhism? There's a lot of Buddhism. Um, well, it seems to me that one claim that is, that is close to the center of Buddhism, fairly broadly speaking, is that the reason we suffer and the reason we make other people suffer is that we don't see the world uh, clearly. Um, you know, we don't see ourselves clearly, we don't see other people clearly, we don't see the world broadly speaking clearly. In fact, uh, our view is so far from clarity that you could say we suffer from serious illusions, and these illusions are the source of our suffering, and they are what uh, makes us behave uh, badly, you might say. Now, this is kind of an amazing claim when you think about it, because it means that in principle you could kill three birds with one stone, right? I mean, by seeing the world clearly, you could become happier and also become a better person. So in principle, uh, truth and happiness and goodness could converge. That's a claim. It's a very strong claim, and, and uh, it would be convenient if true, right, if you could kill three birds with one stone. And I, I, I defend the claim uh, in the book. Um, now, one thing about Buddhism is it doesn't, it doesn't just claim that in principle you could solve the problem that way, that in principle you could kill uh, three birds with one stone. It actually provides the stone. It, it, has, uh, it offers a, 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 you know, a regime of practice and you might say education that is, is supposed to lead to more clarity of vision, less suffering, uh, and, and better behavior. Um, now, the, the practice includes meditation, and I talk a lot about meditation in the book, especially mindfulness meditation. And there's a tendency, I think, to see mindfulness meditation as kind of therapeutic, right? I mean, you hear about mindfulness-based stress reduction, dealing with anxiety, and so on. But I really think that even if that's the way you're using meditation, uh, you're, you're not as far as you might think from really serious spiritual and philosophical uh, exploration. I think there's a natural connection between any kind of mindfulness meditation and, and really deep and in some ways radical claims that are made by uh, Buddhist philosophy. Uh, and in the book I try to provide uh, enough philosophical context um, to, uh, to convince you of that. So I'm defending both the, the Buddhist diagnosis and the Buddhist uh, prescription. Now, I'm not the first person to say that Buddhism is true. Many people have said it over the past 2,500 years, notably Buddhists. Um, and I'm not the first person to, to say I can explain why it's true. Many Buddhist philosophers have done this. Uh, but obviously, uh, the, the premise of like slapping this title on a book is that I have something new to say it, about that. And you might ask, who am I to, uh, to say that after 2,500 years of pondering this, um, you know, I, 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 I have some sort of uh, fresh insight. Well, I have good news for you. I don't claim that, like, I went off and meditated and saw through the core of reality and, and, and was visited with some revelation that, I, that I'm going to share with you. Um, I don't uh, claim any special illumination at all. What I claim is that uh, there is a kind of illumination of the logic behind these Buddhist claims that just was not available until very recently. Okay, and I'm referring to modern psychology and in particular um, modern evolutionary psychology. Uh, now, I, I, uh, I wrote a book some time ago, I don't know, 23 years ago or something, uh, while I was living in Washington called The Moral Animal that was about evolutionary psychology. Uh, and while writing the book, uh, I noticed a couple of things about um, human nature. And one is that uh, we are not designed by natural selection to see the world clearly, necessarily, okay? If you ask what is the criterion by which natural selection engineered the human brain, the human mind, the answer is that the sole criterion at the top of the agenda was getting genes into the next generation. Traits that were conducive to getting genes into the next generation, natural selection favors, period. Whether they make you see clearly or not. Now obviously, in many cases they do make you see clearly. We have a, a, pretty, a pretty good uh, visual perception of the world and that you can see why natural selection would favor that, right? You don't run into things, you don't fall off of cliffs. Um, but even here in the realm of kind of simple visual perception, there are distortions of perception that are built in. So, for example, people tend to overestimate the speed at which large objects are approaching them, 
in the modern environment, it's, it's cars. In, in, in the environment of a revolution, it might have been large animals or, or some guy with a spear, who knows? But it's pretty easy to guess why this is, right? I mean, better safe than sorry. It's better to get out of the way too soon than to get out of the way too late. Now, uh, this is a, a pretty trivial example of a built-in distortion of perception, misestimating the velocity of something. But the point, I'm just making the point that if illusion of any kind will help get genes into the next generation, then natural selection will favor illusion. And I think some of the illusions that have been favored uh, by natural selection correspond pretty well to some of the big illusions that, that Buddhism posits, illusions about the self, uh, and whether there is one in some sense, and illusions uh, about uh, other people in particular, and to some extent, uh, other things. So, the other thing I noticed uh, in writing that book is we're, natural selection definitely did not design us to be happy. Uh, you may have noticed that gratification tends to evaporate, right? And again, it's not hard to imagine why that would be. I mean, if you imagine some animal that eats a meal and then is so contented that it just lies there forever, well, that it will get no more nourishment, right? Natural selection doesn't want that. And, and of course, when I say what natural selection wants something, I'm just, you know, personifying it. It doesn't, it doesn't think, but it does, it does have implied uh, values and goals. Um, you know, same with sex. If you have sex and, 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 and bask in the af afterglow forever, that's not good enough. Natural selection wants you, for good measure, to have sex, you know, some more times. So, you know, if animals are going to stay motivated, they cannot be enduringly gratified. And I assume this sounds familiar to everyone, unless you're very different from me. Um, there are more specific examples of how uh, natural selection doesn't, quote, care whether we're happy. So, you know, if you look at fear, I mean, suppose uh, you're walking through some terrain that you've heard uh, is snake infested, or you heard somebody got bit by a snake and died. Well, probably if you hear the, the, the brush rustling at all, you're going to, like, get scared. And, 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 and if it rustles and, and, like, some lizard runs out, you, will, you may well briefly see a snake where there, when there is, in fact, a lizard. So you're going to feel a lot of fear that is actually, strictly speaking, unnecessary in the sense that most of these times are turned out to be uh, nothing worth worrying about. But again, as with the moving object, natural selection <clears throat> errs on the side of caution. So we get these what you might call false positives uh, in the realm of fear. And, and note that in this case, uh, the suffering is related to an illusion. I mean, you, you, you think there's a snake there and there's not. Uh, now, to make things even worse, so, you know, I mean, you, so already we have a correspondence, right? Buddhism says we are prone to, to suffering, that, that gratification is fleeting, and we don't see the world clearly. Natural selection says, uh, I mean, modern evolutionary biology says that, that you would expect uh, animals to be built that way. Um, the modern environment, in some ways, makes things even worse for us, okay? So, even in the environment of our evolution, we were prone to suffering and not always seeing things clearly, uh, but the modern environment makes things worse. So, for example, you take something like anxiety. Um, evolutionary psychologists would say anxiety is natural. So, if, uh, you know, you imagine many thousands of years ago uh, during human evolution, some, you know, hunter-gatherer toddler wandered off and the parents realized they haven't seen the toddler, you'd expect them to worry and, and think something horrible has happened, go find the kid. That's natural anxiety. Then in the modern environment, you, you do things like uh, drop a child off at a daycare center for the first day where you don't know anybody. That, that's unnatural. <laughs> that, that's, you know, so, so you get, you get ho a whole new kind of anxiety. Um, or take kind of social anxiety. Evolutionary psychologists say it is natural for us to worry about what people think of us because during evolution, people who were highly regarded, had friends, had stature, would have gotten more genes in the next generation. So in that sense, social anxiety is natural. Um, but then in the, in the uh, modern environment, you're put into the kinds of in situations that, that uh, evolution didn't even prepare us for. Like, for example, suppose you're addressing a whole room full of people that you've never met before. I, I, you know, I actually feel, feel fine about this. You've been, you've been very friendly, but the fact is that people have uh, profound uh, public speaking anxieties. 
and they, they, they imagine things happening that aren't going to happen. You know, they imagine apocalyptic things happening if, if, when they give their PowerPoint presentation. So basically, we're prone to suffering naturally and to illusion naturally in some senses. The modern environment um, makes things worse. So the thing about um, thinking about all this from the point of view of evolutionary psychology as I was writing this book is it definitely didn't make my life better. I mean, it, it, it made me, if anything, more acutely conscious of kind of the absurdity of the human predicament <laughs> um, and more conscious of how unjustified some of my feelings were, especially feelings toward other people that, you know, natural selection engineered into us. It's like the way you would think about a rival, say, but it has no basis in objective reality. Um, but I didn't, there, there was, you know, I didn't have anything I could do about it. Um, you know, there was, there was, uh, so if anything, I was, I was in a way less uh, comfortable than ever, more aware uh, of uh, my shortcomings and, and various absurdities and unpleasantnesses, uh, but, but I had uh, nothing to, you know, to, to do about it. Well, I mean, you might say I found the, the truth, at least I believed it was the truth. I, I, I believe natural selection accounts for a lot of this stuff, but I hadn't found a way, you might say. Well, Buddhism offers a way. Um, so for whatever reason, now I was not uh, a natural meditator by any means. I have short attention span, I'm fidgety and so on. Um, I'd never had any success meditating. Finally, somebody convinced me to go to a meditation retreat. Uh, this was in 2003. It was a one-week silent meditation retreat. Um, and it was, a, it was amazing to me. I mean, the first two days were incredibly frustrating. Couldn't focus on my breath and so on. But by the end of the week, uh, I felt my consciousness had been transformed. Um, I had a whole new appreciation of the beauty of various things. Um, I uh, was much less judgmental about people. You know, I remember like at the beginning of the retreat, I was doing my usual thing of just sizing up people I don't know at all and deciding who the jerks are and who the jerks aren't. You know, I remember there was a guy wearing a Juilliard t-shirt and I was thinking, oh, well, aren't we special? We went to Juilliard. Um, and by the end of the retreat, I was much less <laughs> inclined to do that. Uh, I mean, it really was. It was really, it was, I, I was just a, a better person much happier person. I'm not going to say that it's easy to sustain that state of consciousness at the end of a meditation retreat. Some of you have probably been to retreats and you know that the benefits uh, are probably going to wane in intensity and will only last at all if you, if you sustain a daily uh, practice. But anyway, it really got my attention. And so did some specific experiences I had at the retreat. My first kind of big breakthrough at the retreat was uh, it was a morning when I had had too much coffee. And so I had this, you know, this feeling in my jaw, this kind of clenched jaw feeling, you know, like, like you're really stressed out. It was really uncomfortable. And I was sitting there meditating, and uh, I just kind of wanted to get away from it. I wanted it to go away. And then I remembered, well, what you're in theory supposed to do is just kind of accept it, observe it, don't run away from it. And so I, I did that. And uh, by now I'd gotten pretty good at focus, you know, this was several days into the retreat, uh, and, and a strange thing happened. It was like, suddenly, I just thought, well, the feeling is down there in my jaw, but I'm up here, and it doesn't have any, it's not causing me any trouble at all. I was still observing it, the feeling persisted for a while, but it was no longer unpleasant. And in principle, that kind of thing can happen. Uh, it is you know, I've, I've had experiences like that with anxiety. Uh, again, it's, it, it doesn't always happen. I, I guarantee you I'm not free of anxiety, but I've had, I've had times when I meditated on anxiety and a kind of a knot of anxiety uh, inside me suddenly looked as if it was just like a piece of abstract art or something. It was just, I was completely indifferent to it. <laughs> um, so that got my attention. Um, there did seem to be uh, uh, something to this claim that meditation can, can help you with uh, suffering. Now, again, uh, this stuff sounds kind of therapeutic, I guess, dealing with anxiety, dealing with stress. So I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I, I don't have time to elaborate on this. I think this kind of experience, dealing with emotions, where there's a kind of ironically, you quit running away from them, accept them, experience them more deeply, and ironically, that gives you a kind of critical distance from them. Um, 
this kind of experience, I, I think, is, is in a way a step on the path in, toward what Buddhists call the experience of not-self, which is a very dramatic experience that most meditators probably never have, those who have it. Uh, may not carry it into everyday life. I, 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 if you're curious in Q&A, you can ask me about not self. Um, the other, the other uh, thing I want to talk about r relevant to this retreat uh, is the, the, the Buddhist concept of emptiness. Uh, this is a kind of a misleading uh, term. Um, it, it, you know, when people say, you know, you know the, the Buddhist, uh, you know, according to Buddhist, clear perception is to see the emptiness of things and that's like what does that mean um, and if you ask them to give you a definition they say well things lack inherent existence that doesn't make a whole lot of sense so let me just tell you an experience I had on my first retreat that I think captures uh, what is actually meant by the term and what the actual significance kind of in human affairs is um, so I was taking a walk and I saw uh, a weed it's called a plantain weed and I had, I had actually spent a lot of time trying to kill plantain weeds. In fact, at this house, only, only a mile or so away from here, I had, I mean, a lot of time because I didn't want to use chemicals, so I was like digging them up, uh, you know, one by one. And I just, I looked at it and I thought, why do we even call this a weed? You know, mm. like, this looks just as beautiful as all the other foliage. And, um, you know, by what objective criteria? would you call this a weed, whereas these other green leafy things are not weeds? And I, I, I wasn't just making an analytical point that there's, there are no objective criteria. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a deep perceptual feeling, okay? It just, there was something different about my perception of a weed. And the way you would put it in terms of Buddhist philosophy is to say it no longer had essence of weed, okay? Another way of, of putting the doctrine of emptiness is to say that that we shouldn't, you know, we are inclined to project essence onto things. Essence of weed, essence of anything, essence of my car, essence of my dog, es essence of cars generally. Um, and the point being made is that these are actually artificial categories, constructs, uh, and they kind of very subtly infiltrate our, per our perception in ways that I think involve feeling, um, and the claim is that a more objective view of reality uh, does, not, does not feature um, essence, okay? Now, uh, and by the way, people who really adept meditators, I interviewed a number of people who, who have clearly gone well down the meditative path. Some of them say they feel emptiness all the time. And they, they, they say something that I'm saying about this is that it, it's, not, it's not what it sounds like. They say, if anything, things are more beautiful. Things are are less unlike one another, but they're more beautiful. They are luminous, um, and so on. Now, in closing, I just want to get back a little, by way of emptiness and essence, um, to this question of the current uh, political moment. Because, um, you know, essence, uh, it's not that big a deal whether you see essence uh, of weed in a weed. But when you see, like, essence a bad person and a person you consider bad, um, the, the stakes are much, are much higher, uh, or essence of enemy and someone you uh, consider an enemy. Um, and it seems to be the case that the essences we perceive in people um, can trigger cognitive biases that influence the way we process information about them. How much time? Hmm? Well, when did I start, like five after? Okay, so just a few more minutes. Um, so let me say that if anybody's curious in Q&A, there is a cognitive bias I could talk about right now, but I'm not going to because <laughs> I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, but it really, it really is uh, significant. L let me talk quickly about another uh, cognitive bias that uh, – that is responsible, that, that, that plays a role in, in the current polarization. It's, it's, what, uh, it's what is responsible for the spread of so-called fake news. Now, I submit that most of us have helped promulgate fake news. At least I certainly have retweeted uh, things, or you can share them on Facebook or whatever, without really checking them out thoroughly, mm -hmm. right? Because I, because I so much wanted them to be true, because they reflected unfavorably on the other guys, 
or they reflected favorably on my side. But uh, the point I want to make is that it, it was a feeling. It felt it felt good. You you know when you when you retweet or share something on Facebook, it's usually driven by a feeling, and and this this. Uh, this cognitive bias is known as confirmation bias, the idea that we uh, accept and, and attach uh, credibility to news that favors our side of the argument and don't notice or reject news that favors the other side of the argument. That's called confirmation bias. And this is one of the things that, uh, that drives the fake news on both sides, that drives the polarization. Um, and the, as in so many things, there is, as I said, a feeling involved. In fact, I think one of the correspondences between traditional Buddhist psychology and modern psychology is the recognition of how subtly feelings influence cognition. And mindfulness meditation, one thing it, it does, I think, is make you much more aware of how feelings are influencing your behavior and the kind of, the kind of feelings that various people are kind of giving you and how that's influencing the way you think about them. Um, so I actually think mindfulness meditation can, in this sense, uh, make you... Uh, a better, a better citizen in a certain sense. Now, I could elaborate, uh, but instead I would just do two things quickly. One is to plug a website I just started called mindfulresistance.net. I happen to be someone who is not a big Trump supporter. There may be some Trump supporters here. That's fine. Three of my four siblings voted for Trump. We're still speaking occasionally. Um, <laughs> But, but the, the idea here is that a, a more, even if you don't meditate, the idea is meditation could help you uh, think more circumspectly about, about kind of Trumpism and respond to it more wisely. But even if you don't meditate, just circumspection is good. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of overreaction uh, on, the, on, the, on the side, uh, on my side of, of, of this argument that, that, that sometimes... It isn't just that it helps Trump, it's that it deepens uh, political polarization generically, which I just think is a bad thing. So anyway, there's that. We have a weekly newsletter at mindfulresistance.net. If you go there and sign up for it, it will be emailed to you. The other thing I, I just want to say is, now I should first warn you that, you know, I mean, you, you should discount what I'm about, about to say because I am prone to apocalyptic thinking. I am prone to focus on how various malign forces could spin out of control. But I think it's at least possible that we're at a point in history where the only alternative to deeper strife and chaos is for people to become more aware of how their minds work, including the subtle ways that feelings infiltrate their cognition, trigger cognitive biases, and so on, um, and how their minds are really, in important ways, distorting the perception of uh, reality. Now, there are ways to do this without mindfulness meditation. It, it's, it's, it's not the only way. I mean, the main thing, I think, is that we, in one way or another, reach for some kind of, like, you might call it metacognition, awareness of the way uh, the mind works. Uh, I think that would be very good for the world. Um, and if, uh, as Buddhism suggests, uh, this makes uh, people uh, not just better people but happier people, then so much the better. So that's it. Thank you. Do you, want to, do you want to call on people or should I? Oh, okay. That saves. That's good. So I guess you can come up to the microphone if you have a question. You need to talk more about your approach toward uh, Trump and that essence and how you approach that. Well, I mean, I'm, I, I, one thing I actually haven't done a lot, which I should try to do, is like sit down when I'm meditating. I, I do meditate. And actually meditate on Trump. I mean, uh, I have had experiences through meditation where people I considered kind of mortal enemies, I thought of in a new light. And this wasn't through, like, so-called loving-kindness meditation. That's a specific kind of meditation uh, devoted to that. Uh, it's just that I think mindfulness meditation can allow you to just have a more objective take on things. So I've had success thinking about uh, enemies in a non-hostile way and really viewing them in a totally new light. Not that I have a ton of enemies, but uh, in any event, you know, that, that's one thing. That, so that's one thing some people do, and, and, and I think in principle that could work. 
Um, now, did you, do you want me to say more about what I think a mindful approach to Trumpism would be? No, I'm curious about the essence. You talked oh, the, about the essence and how you would. Oh, the thing, the cognitive bias thing? Right. I think so. Okay, well, here, here's, this is a, what I think is one of the most interesting cognitive biases. And, it, and it, 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 it tends to be triggered by putting a person in a particular category. Okay, it's called, it was originally called the fundamental attribution error. And the idea was we tend naturally to attribute too much to people's dispositions in explaining their behavior and not enough to the circumstances shaping their behavior. So you're at a store, you see somebody is rude to the clerk, and you say, that's a jerk, right? That's what we tend to do. Whereas for all you know, they just found out they had a fatal disease or they had a bad day at the office or who knows? You just don't know. But we tend to attribute things to disposition rather than to circumstance. At least uh, that, that was the original conception of the fundamental attribution error. Now, it turns out to be more complicated in a really interesting way. The, the, the way it works is this. With our friends and allies, if they do something good, we tend to attribute it to their disposition. That's the kind of people they are. They're good people. If they do something bad, we explain it away via circumstance or situation. You know, we say, this is a real thing. This is the way it works. You know, oh, well, they were just under peer pressure or they had had a stressful day or whatever. With enemies and rivals, it works the other way. If they do something bad, we attribute that to uh, their disposition. That's just the kind of people they are. Of course they did something bad, they're bad people. If they do something good, we explain it away. They were trying to impress somebody or, you know, whatever. And this has real consequence. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the run-up to a war, it's one reason that one people who, that, that it's one reason people who favor the invasion really want to demonize the leader of the country. Because if you've got them in, the, in that box, then they can't get out of it. Once, um, once you're, th when, you know, anything they do that's, that's good, you'll explain away, and anything they do that's bad will reinforce the image. In the context of political polarization, you see the same thing. I mean, once we have, as we do now in America, virtually two tribes uh, who have each other, you know, in a very unflattering category, it's going to be hard for them to get out, right? If they do, if you hear that they did something uh, nice or good, you'll explain that away as not really reflecting on the essential them. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of thing that locks, locks you into political polarization once you're there. So that's the cognitive bias I was thinking of that seems to be triggered by the essence we attribute to people. Do we get that friend and ally vibe from them or that enemy rival vibe from them? Thank you. Is this, is this working? Yeah. Um, uh, I guess my main question is, could you just talk a little bit in, in the terms you were about um, our, uh, the evolutionary uh, psychological advantages of denial? Well, the, um, I mean, we deny a, a lot of things about ourselves. Uh, I mean, for example, we, uh, I mean, you can imagine, ben, if you just mean like not facing unpleasant information, you can imagine some virtue there. But I think w when it comes to, uh, from, you know, from just the point of view of maintaining psychological uh, health, I guess, but um, when it comes to thinking of ourselves, we have a pretty uh, systematically warped view of ourselves. And in fact, the, you know, that, the cognitive bias I just mentioned, you can imagine how it plays out with us, right? When I do good things, that's me. When I do bad things, I didn't have my nap. Um, and, uh, and there's a whole range of, of biases that apply uh, to the self that I, uh, that I get into in the book. I mean, it turns out that, uh, you know, the average person considers themselves above average. You know, like the, wake, the Lake Wobegon thing. It's true. People, you know, uh, particularly in moral categories, you know, the, how good a person are you? Uh, fairly large majority of people consider themselves above average, and of course that can't be the case. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of things we naturally deny about ourselves. There's all kinds of biases about the self that I get into. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not sure how much that. Well, if, and then if you could make the leap to specifically climate uh, Denial, oh. change, denial. 
Well, you know, I think that's an interesting case because I think I, I think the thing about climate is, uh, you know, once you're in a tribe, I mean, some people, the first thing they heard about climate change was it's the other tribe that thinks it's real or it's the other tribe that doesn't think it's real. I mean, face it, very few of us actually have looked deeply into climate change, right? I mean, almost everyone accepts their view on, on, on some sort of authority in some sense. I happen to believe it's real, but, but uh, it's just the human mind, you know, we haven't all exhaustively investigated the basis for all our beliefs. We tend to go with people we trust, and when that's a tribe, and when, moreover, the belief on an issue is like an important marker for the tribe, right, then that's what shapes your belief. So, uh, to me, you know, I, 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 it, to me, it's not so much an issue of uh, denial. I, I think denial, in some sense, works in 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 both directions. I mean, I, I, and I, and I think, and this is one thing I, you know, with this mindful resistance thing, I, I, I really encourage us all to inspect the way our own biases are processing, are affecting our processing of the information here and, and our view of the the other people. I agree with you. That yeah. Has, I was kind of getting at that. Yeah. Uh, um, so. Interesting. The, yeah. the, the tiger in the rushes um, in, the, in the fishing village, I, I think. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, so I'm in a Vipassana community. Mm hmm And I discovered it by accident. It's wonderful. We should me. say to people, Vipassana is a kind of it's a type meditation of, it's that's, a, that's kind of now closely associated with mindfulness. It's not exactly the same thing, but... Right. So that's getting to my question, and the question is, I've discovered it by accident, and it's been life-changing for me, but I don't know about other meditation Buddhist or a religious Buddhist groups that I could look into. I don't know of those, and I'm wondering if you you could s say something about well, you here there are groups like this around. Would that be advertising for you? Or? Well, I mean, as it happens, I've done all I've done you know uh, of the of the kind of like I guess seven meditation retreats I've done. Six have been in vipassana. That's basically my tradition. Mm -hmm. um, now there is Zen, which is different. Uh, there is, I went to a, a Shambhala retreat, that's different, uh, that's in the Tibetan tradition. Um, you know, the old, the, the kind of stereotype is, you know, uh, Zen is for poets, Tibetan is for artists, and Vipassana is for psychologists. Um, and I, I think, I, I, I do the, 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 of course, all stereotypes are at best exaggerations, but um, the part about Vipassana being good for psychologists I think is true. I think it was the right thing for me to do writing this book because it's a very analytical, uh, well, I'm kind of conflating it with mindfulness here, but, but, but uh, and this is true of mindfulness, it, 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 it's, a, it's an analytical practice that helps you view the workings of your mind. Um, yeah. uh, so when you were talking about um, disposition versus circumstances, uh, the question pops up in my mind, so there's no such thing as evil? Is there any such thing as evil? Um, or good, for that matter. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought I was going to get off easy and just have to explain evil. Sorry. But no, no. I have to do good as well. Um, the, uh, I, I would say that, you know, Buddhism has been accused of being nihilistic. Not that everyday Buddhists go around saying nothing matters. In fact, everyday Buddhists uh, think that uh, all sentient beings are precious. That's a, a fundamental belief. But th the idea is that if you become less judgmental in the common sense of less judgmental of people and, and in the more subtle sense of less judgmental as you process your feelings and, and thoughts and you, and, and you, just look, you just accept feelings as they come and like, uh, it's not so much that this one's good, this one's bad, they're just, the feelings just, just don't get wrapped up in them too much, you know, ref reflect, or reflect on them and decide which ones you think are uh, worth following. Um, I, the, the, do you want my view on evil or I mean, the, the Buddhists Buddhist have been accused of, like, maybe not taking that seriously enough. 
I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a serious problem. Uh, it it d doesn't actually uh, surface in the everyday lives of, of the Buddhists I know. My own view of evil is that I think uh, it's in many ways an unfortunate word because it it it, it the many people take it to mean there's like some kind people are like possessed by some force they're evil and if you believe that then you kind of quit trying to explain their behavior and my own preference is in favor of actually uh, trying to explain why even the most horrific people in the world did the things they did but that's just me that's not Buddhism we don't have time for good I'm afraid hi um don't take this as a criticism of Buddhism, because... No, oh, believe me, I'm above that now, that I, <laughs> that okay. I meditate. Whatever you're going to criticize, I am not attached no, to, believe me. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I'll give you more relief. This is not even a criticism. Okay. It seems to me, and I meditate, and I develop my own system. I'm a very independent person. It seems to me, though that it's almost time to move a little bit beyond Buddhism because what we know with physics now and quantum physics and, and a lot of the other sciences, uh, we, can, we can grapple with being a human being. In other words, if we spend a lot of time picking our cognitive self apart, that in itself sort of becomes an anxiety activity. So my point is that at a certain point, it's necessary to move beyond cognitive, not that you dismiss it, but move into a greater energy force so that the self, we can go beyond the self and, and actually develop a sort of comfortable place where we can exist without getting all tied up with our thinking all the time. And uh, for me, yeah. this has worked very well. And it takes time. But the point is, the Buddhism, for me, stopped me at a certain point. For one thing, I don't like the first thing being life is suffering. That bothers me. Mm -hmm. So is there any, my question to you, do you see any movement anywhere in going sort of beyond Buddhism and, and bringing, incorporating more energy as opposed to getting stuck on cognitive. Well, I, I think a lot of people are doing different things, but I would say that what you're describing, as I understand what you're talking about, it sounds kind of Buddhist to me. I, I mean, the, the um, you know, I mean, there is this idea of not self in, in Buddhism, and that certainly involves getting less tangled up in your thinking, to say the least. Uh, and, and less tangled up in your feelings, to say the least, and in fact uh, becoming so not attached to these things that constitute your tra traditional sense of identity that um, the very bounds of yourself may seem to dissolve and there may seem to be a kind of a continuity of identity between you and other forms of life. And I've had little glimpses of this on retreat, of what that would be like, but I know people I've interviewed people who seem to feel it on a regular basis. So I guess I'd say I'm not sure that that's as different from, uh, you know, I mean, we, 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 don't, we don't, you know, have, have time to explore it. It may be that if I did explore it more, I'd, I'd appreciate what you meant. But I'm not sure it's as non-Buddhist as you think. A quick point on the, the, the idea that light, life is suffering. Um, this is, uh, actually, the Buddha never says life is suffering per se in that fa first famous serving, he, he, sermon. He says there's a lot of it. Moreover, the term that, that uh, is used, dukkha, that's translated as suffering, a lot of people think could also be translated as unsatisfactoriness. You know, we always want things to be a little different than they are. And you can see why natural selection would make us like it, because things can always be better from natural selection's point of view. Uh, you can have more food, you can have more status, you can have, and so we're, we're restless by nature. And according to some translations of dukkha, that's what's really being captured there. Um, yeah. Hi, thanks. I, um, <clears throat> I'm a very regular reader of David Brooks in the New York Times, and one of the points that he's been making in recent years that is that there's kind of a developing crisis of um, uh, people having a sense of purpose and meaning 
meaning in their lives. That this has been on, we've been on a downtrend in the Western world in the level of the sense that we have that things are meaningful in our lives. And um, for reasons I'm not sure I entirely understand, he thinks this is a really bad and a really dangerous thing. So I guess it's somewhat off subject here, uh, the, the question of purpose, purposefulness in one's life, but I think you can probably make some connection between Buddhism and that problem, if you see it as a problem. So the question is, do you think there is a trend, first of all, towards uh, a greater problem in finding purposefulness in life? Does Buddhism have something to offer in reversing the trend that does exist? And anything else that you might want to say about the connection between Buddhism and finding meaning in one's life? Okay. Well, I think, I mean, one thing that uh, probably alarms David Brooks or at least gets his attention is that the traditional providers of purpose, you know, organized religion, have less sway over people, especially right. people in kind of his demographic, well-educated people. But, but more and more, uh, I think broadly, uh, they, they have less sway. And I, I think it, it's potentially a problem in the sense that people want to have a purpose, and they will find one usually, right? right. And, and if they find one by belonging to a group that hates another group, uh, then that's suboptimal to say the least. And I think right now in America, there's a certain amount of that going around. As for Buddhism, um, I mean, first of all, Buddhists are not magically immune to this. You've probably read the stories of rampaging Buddhist monks. It happens every once in a while, you know. Uh, but as far as, um, although, by the way, you know, most, most Buddhists in Asia don't meditate. Many Buddhist monks don't meditate. It, it's a kind of a, a Western stereotype that, that, uh, that they do. I, I mean, Westerners think, you know, Buddhists, they don't believe in God, they do meditate. No, they don't meditate. They do believe in deities. And, and uh, but, but, um, but anyway, the, uh, the central value of Buddhism is that uh, what you should do is, uh, you know, uh, nurture the well-being of other sentient beings. Uh, and, and that's a great, that's a great purpose. Um, you know, it's certainly not the only ethical guide that, that Buddhism offers. I, I think, you know, the, by and large, the ethical guidelines are very commendable. Um, but uh, I guess I share the concern that people are finding their, their purpose in, in ways that are, that are not great. Right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hello. Oh, right. That's okay. Right. Um, my question has to do it, uh, with the evolutionary psychology and, the, uh, and an aspect of Buddhism, which is to see things clearly. But if you look at, evolutionary, at evolution as a group thing, not an individual reproduction, but a group thing, and you look at untruths or myths and superstitions as, and religion as a, as a glue to hold groups, that it almost has... Uh, the falsity almost uh, is evolutionary, evolutionarily necessary in order to provide group cohesion. There's a function in myth, in superstition. It seems like people are forced to, to, to subordinate themselves and their perception of things in order to stick with a group or to be bound to a group. And oftentimes those things are wrong. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's disagreement within evolutionary psychology. This is so technical, I will not spend time on it, but over whether much in the way of, quote, group selection happens or it's more individual selection. But I don't, I don't think, um, uh, you know, how much stuff evolves for the good of the group per se. That said, there's no doubt that people, by their nature, are, in, are motivated to accept prevailing beliefs in a group that they identify uh, closely with and, and that, you know, peer pressure matters. There's a famous old social science experiment where they, they have two lines. One is clearly longer than the other. And they go around the table and like the first five people are confederates, okay? They're part of the experiment. And then the last few people are, they don't realize, they, they think all of the people are just kind of, uh, you know, off the street. And the first five say, yeah, the, uh, they point the short line and they say that one's longer. And, and then by the end, everyone's saying the short line is longer. So I don't know if they really believe it, but, but people 
uh, are motivated, uh, you know, under many circumstances. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the nature. We agree on the nature of human nature, regardless of the technical issue of how it evolved. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for your book. Um, I've been practicing Nichiren Buddhism for a long time, and also I'm an environmental protection specialist at EPA, working on climate change adaptations, up until a few months ago. Um, mm. What I'd like to know is, during your interviews, did you talk to people who were involved in the White House meeting of Buddhist leaders two years ago? There were about 80-some people from 60 different Buddhist uh, traditions, and they issued the people's, the Buddhist um, charge for climate change and also um, uh, a statement about racism and justice. And I didn't know whether you talked to any of those I folks didn't. at all. I didn't. I mean, okay. I may have, but I didn't know that they were part of that group if I did. All right. Yeah, so the One Earth Sangha, somebody had asked about climate change, is one of the networks that involves a lot of trans-Buddhist work mm -hmm. on climate change and will be involved um, not just on the local organizing level, but also at the policy level. So Okay, so I it's called One Earth Sangha? Sangha. Mm -hmm. So if people yeah. are interested in that, they can Google they can it, I guess. Google it. So Sangha is the Buddhist term for community. It's like a, a, you know, a Buddhist community. And in fact, meditators often try to find a local Sangha, a group of meditators that they can fit in with, but it's S-A-N-G-H-A. What, you said one world or one earth? One earth. One earth sangha. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You said at the beginning of your talk that uh, a lot of the dissatisfaction Buddhism talks about comes from uh, living a modern life and we have a lot of evolutionary drives. I'm curious, uh, as life becomes... Oh yeah, so basically what I was trying to say is uh, you said earlier that a lot of dissatisfaction comes from basically evolutionary drives that have not been programmed for our modern life. As life becomes more modern, technology becomes more of an everyday thing. Can you talk about how you how you use it personally and how that might impact people's consciousness? It's a challenge. I mean, you know, these. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the problems with modern life is that you know gratification. I mean, it's bad enough that it's fleeting, but it, but it used to be um, that you know in, in olden days, you know, thousands of years ago at least it took some work to earn it. I mean, you may ask why I think that's a good thing, right? You know, maybe you'd rather just have instant gratification. But we now know the answer that if gratification is truly instant, bad things tend to happen. Heroin provides instant gratification. Addictive things provide instant gratification. So in the modern world, they figured how to tap into the pleasure uh, centers and social media uh, do that. I mean, the whole online world is increasingly, there's more and more science devoted to figuring out how to get people addicted to various things online. And the algorithms uh, on Facebook, and increasingly Twitter, I'm sorry to say, uh, which used to be almost algorithm-free, um, are designed to show people things that they're going to feel like sharing and retweeting. I mean, I, per I, I think this is a, 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 an undiscussed significant problem. That, that just that they design uh, your news feed consists of a bunch of things that a bunch of people have shared. Well, people tend to share things impulsively without reflection and things that make them feel good. So I, I personally think the algorithms themselves are a big tribalizing factor. As for I, how I handle, I mean, I've had long period, like recently, I went several weeks just saying, I, I can't look at Twitter before 8.30 at night. It'll just, uh, it's, and it was great. Uh, I mean, it was good for me. I got more work done. I had more peace of mind. And of course, there are, you know, there, there are self-disciplined softwares that keep you from looking at certain sites and so on. But it's a, it's a real challenge. To even go beyond that, though, they say like, people who look at Facebook too much can be depressed. They say like, people who use Facebook too often can be depressed. Do you think, yeah. do you think that like, as, we, as we grow and understand more of this, it's an ethical responsibility on companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to kind of take into account the potential negative mental health effects they're having on people? Yeah. Then I, I don't see any signs that they're really taking it seriously, honestly. I mean, they respond to the latest thing they're accused of doing. So like, fake news becomes a problem, so they say, okay, we're gonna like, get a bunch of people to try to ward off fake news. But the, the fake news problem, I think, has this deeper, it's in the nature of the algorithm that people are encouraged to share, to see things that they'll it, it, it's just the way, it's, it's like the way they put junk food at the checkout counter. That's what Facebook's algorithm is like. Oh, hi, Bob. Or, hi, Bob. Um, I finished the book last night, really enjoyed it. Thank you. 
Um, so I had a couple of questions here. One is about, can you talk about modular mind? And also, can you talk about feelings as the glue that reinforces the cell? OK. Uh, quickly, the modular mind is a model of the mind that uh, emerged largely from evolutionary psychology. In the book, I argue that it's very consistent with the Buddhist concept of not self. And it's consistent with some specific things that you may have heard meditation teachers say, especially on retreat. They'll say things like, thoughts think themselves. And what they mean, they're describing the way it feels after you meditate a lot and, 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 and are less attached to the various contents of your mind. And you start going like, wait a second, I didn't think that thought. It just showed up. And then it disappeared. And according to the modular model of the mind, that's actually true. So in this model, there are all these subterranean modules that are specialized. There's the one in charge of impressing prospective mates or the one in charge of getting you some food or whatever. All these different things, and they're kind of competing in a certain sense uh, for airtime. And the one that wins gets to inject its thought into your consciousness. And, and it's in the nature of, well, I would say it's in the nature of the, uh, the kind of illusion that natural selection built into us to take possession of the thoughts, to assume that we actually, to identify with them, take ownership, say, yeah, that's my thought, but actually the process of generating them is much more uh, decentralized. Um, on, on, did that, was that, that was, did I just say something indu that induced whatever that sound was? <laughs> good, good. Uh, the, on feelings, I mean, yeah, well, let's just talk about thoughts. I mean, in general, again, I think the role of feelings in cognition and in governing our behavior in everyday life is really underappreciated. More and more modern psychology appreciates it. This fact has been implicit in Buddhist psychology forever. Mindfulness meditation makes you more aware of it, of how subtly feelings influence you. And a good example is these thoughts these thoughts that float by, you, you come to realize that thoughts come with feelings. You, you know, it's, there may be no such thing as a thought that you don't either like or dislike. Uh, and, and in fact, um, an argument I make in the book is that actually the strength of the feeling associated with the thought is what determines which thought wins. Uh, and that, for the reasons that the brain would be designed by that, uh, that way by natural selection. But, yeah, feel, feeling is, is the glue uh, that attaches us to thoughts, I think. And, and that's why I think, you know, these serious meditators, I mean, if, you, if, if any of you haven't been to a retreat, went to a meditation retreat, a mindfulness retreat for a week, you'd probably get to the point where you were identifying less closely with feelings uh, and they were just kind of floating by and they weren't so much good or bad. They just were. And um, that... You, you would probably not get so quickly to the point where you saw thoughts that way. And I think the reason that there tends to be this progression, first people get a little distance from feelings and then from thoughts, is that I, th I think feelings are the glue that attaches us to thoughts. And so you have to get a little distance from the feelings before you get a little distance from the thoughts. But that's kind of a conjecture. Are we out of? OK. Well, uh, first of all, I want to apologize uh, for, for the question a little bit. Um, I, I read the book, and I'm very much interested in I'm personally searching for sort of some kinds of answers that Buddhism and everything might be able to handle. But uh, it struck me a bit, especially in your talk, that it, it, I, I don't quite understand the difference between or why this isn't opiate of a mass of individuals. And a big part of, of social, of, of evolutionary psychology is how humans have been so tremendously social. And that's why we're able to outcompete all the other humanoid uh, groups and the other animals because of our tremendous social capabilities. And especially in this day and age, we need social movements to really, really try to put right what's definitely off tracks. And it seems like uh, th th this approach is just a, a, a hyper individualistic way of going about it. And I just don't see how that will work in this day and age. So are you afraid that like uh, meditation will drain people of their passion for justice or their, their passion to change the way things are? Is that part of the concern? Uh, yes, it'll absorb a lot of their energy in looking inward. Yeah. Um, it's conceivable that that could happen. I, and frankly, I've known people who I thought had gone so far down the path uh, that uh, 
things didn't trouble them that I thought should trouble them. They were so good at coping with their environment. In my experience, that's very rare. And just speaking for myself, um, I am so far from that. I, and, 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 and I mean, my challenge is just uh, maintaining enough clarity of vision and equanimity that uh, I can pursue the things that I think are important in an effective and balanced way uh, and not like uh, gratuitously insult people along the way because they disagree with me and stuff like that. So I think, I mean, I just think it's hard to look at America right now and say that the problem is an excess of peace of mind and equanimity, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, we, if, if that day comes, I will, I, I will launch a crusade for more passion um, but I, I, don't, I don't think we're there. But it's, it's an actual thing that can happen. It, it really is. And it's true that, you know, Buddhist practice can be an individual thing, uh, although people find it much easier to sustain a practice if they do find a local community, and, and that's, that's what's best. Um, and there are, uh, you know, I should say, there is such thing as socially engaged Buddhism. It's an actual... Uh, um, I, I'm affiliated with Union Theological Seminary in New York. They, have a, they now have a degree program in, in Buddhism. It's a very ecumenical uh, place, and a big emphasis there is uh, socially engaged Buddhism. And right now we're trying to organize an event there later in the fall uh, involving me and a few other people on this very subject. So I guess that's it. Thanks.